1 Samuel chapter 4. And we're going to be uh, starting out in, um, in verse 4. Now, um, prior to this uh, scripture, uh, God, um, it, 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 it goes through quite a few years, but God uh, tells Samuel that, um, that I'm going to use you and that uh, I'm not going to use uh, Eli or his house anymore because of all the wicked things that they've done. The Bible goes through it, and you could read that. Um, they, they would, um, God, God commanded them to, to cook the meat a certain way, and uh, they, would, they um, didn't want to do it because they wanted the, the meat with the fat on there, and, and they, were, there was just, they were wicked people. And uh, God was displeased. And so Eli would refuse to, to discipline his, his own children, um, Hophni and Phinehas, and uh, God said that they're both going to die in one day. Um, and uh, he said that, Samuel, I'm going to use you. You're going to be in place of Eli. Well, the Bible says um, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, and we're going to go in verse 4, so the people sent to Shiloh that they might... Oh, sorry, actually, you know what? I wanted to put the verse in first, and I did not write it down. It was in chapter 3. Um, let's see. Uh, wished I would have wrote that down. Give me one second here. Oh, actually, no, I was right. First uh, Samuel chapter 4. It is chapter 4. Uh, so we're going to be in uh, verse, uh, verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring forth thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelt between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. Then, uh, and when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. Now, so if, if you were to um, watch it on TV today, uh, if, you, if you were to be able to see what had happened, essentially, they're over there, you know, cooking their cooking their beans and everything like that over the campfire, preparing for war, and uh, just waiting out when they're going to go to battle. One's on one camp, one's on the other side. And then all of a sudden, there's just people screaming out of excitement. And they're thinking, what's going on? You know, is this, is this the battle cry? Or are they, are they going to be just coming around the bend now, you know, trying to capture us unaware? What's going on? And... The Philistines, the Bible says in verse 7, were afraid and said, God has come into the camp. That's something. These Philistines worshipped, and you'll find out the name of their god later on, Dagon. They go out and they worship their false god, but what do they say? God, capital G. That, you know, this is re referencing the one true God, is come into the camp. And, and you know what's crazy is, as Christians, we don't realize how much the world is terrified of God. Um, if you actually uh, listen to uh, people that, have, that were Satanists, you know, people that, that worship the devil, and uh, they, they've uh, turned their life over to God, they've gotten saved, they've uh, told stories, quite a few of them, of how these demons that are supposed to be uh, helping them and, you know, uh, and uh, these, these uh, beings cannot handle God. They can't handle Jesus. They, it's just like they're in, they're in pain when they hear the name. The world knows who God is. The world is terrified of the power of God. Just like these people. And they said, woe unto us. For there hath not such a good thing here to for. 
Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hands of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the, uh, the, Egypt, sorry, the Egyptians with all the plagues of the wilderness. These, and, and they're saying, plural, gods. You know, they, they're, they're saying, you know, how can this God, how, can, how could he, he do all these things? Not only has he, he this is a God who, who, who took care of the Egyptians, these, this mighty group of people. This is the God that did this. This is the God that did this. What are we going to do? Complete despair. Woe unto us. In verse 9 it says, Be strong. Quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. So there's a pep rally. Um, I've said this before a couple of times that I'm not really good at basketball at all. I talk pretty good game, but that's about as far as it gets. I'm not good at basketball. I'm not that coordinated. You know, when the, when the teenager's around, I'll, I'll, of course, try to talk a lot of smack to them, you know, and try to, try to put them in their place. But let's be honest, I cannot play basketball. Even as a young teenager, the only thing I could really do in basketball was I was really good at passing it to somebody else. And I could steal the ball, but that was about it. I couldn't dribble very well. Um, I was, uh, the only thing I could do is if nobody was yelling at me, no one was guarding me, I could hit that three-point shot all day long. I would just sit there and just swoosh it all day long. But that was without anybody in my face trying to block me. That was without people screaming in the bleachers. That was without any of that. I was a terrible, terrible player. And I kind of remember, sort of a pep rally, my brother, the, my oldest brother, he, just, he decided he was going to be the coach for the team. And he played where he was the other team that just annihilated everybody. He was a very good player. My brother would, would dunk on the other team. He was, he, was very, he was someone that I looked up to, like, I want to play like him. And I remember there was a couple times where we were in the locker room. We were getting ready and trying to pump ourselves up. And then word gets out, you know, that, oh, oh no, this is the team. The team that's undefeated for the season in our, in our uh, region. And then we're sitting there thinking, what are we going to do? And I remember my brother would be like, you know, hey, you know, guys, you can take them. You know, God can do this, you know, and, you know, let's just pray and ask God to give us a. But deep inside, we were doubtful. I can imagine it. Obviously, this is a lot more serious. This is war. This is. This isn't just a game and then you're over and you go down to Dairy Queen and get ice cream after. This is, if you don't win this, you die. This is, you know, you, your family is, uh, is slaves for the rest of their lives or they're killed. So this is serious. And they're, they're thinking, what are we going to do? Oh, no. Woe is us. And the Philistines were scared. The Bible says that they were saying, what are we going to do? Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? In verse 10, the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man to his tent. And there was a great, or sorry, a very great slaughter for, uh, for there fell of Israel 30 thousand footmen and the ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli Hophni and Phinehas were slain you know there's always a payment for sin and I kind of wonder um, if this story similar to the one pastor was talking about a, a, I think maybe two messages ago about the sin that was in the camp how this one man 
um, was, um, or it might, it might have even been Brother Mullins, I can't remember, but was, did the message about the, a man that took the clothes and buried them in the tent. And, and all these people died. I kind of wonder if Hophni and Phinehas were the reason why all these people died. Oh, there was, there, they were excited. They were ecstatic. God is with us. God is here. It's the, it's the, um, the ark. We're going to win this. They're ecstatic. They're screaming. They're so happy. And the Philistines are almost defeated before they even start the battle. The Philistines, in chapter 5, verse 1, took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Very, very interesting story that is... uh, that if you read about Dagon, Dagon is the fish god. Um, if you look at uh, this time, this time period, the uh, uh, the mes- in in the Mediterranean Sea, this is the, which is really where they're right next to. The fishing is the, is the lifeblood. Um, this uh, city, Ashdod. If you actually look at it today, there's old Ashdod and, and new Ashdod in Israel, and it's it's a sea. Yeah, area. It's one of the bigger cities in Israel today, still. Um, but uh, fishing was a major, major thing. So um, Dagon was the god of fertility and agriculture. And this is this is why I'm just looking up on online fertility and agriculture. So if you aren't, if you're, uh, you're not having. Um, uh, any children, and you're trying to have children, you know what you need to do? You need to, go to, you need to go to Dagon and offer to Dagon. If your crops aren't growing, you know what? Dagon is the god of the day. You know, this is the guy. Dagon is the man. So they have all these different gods, and Dagon is the one that gets the ark. So the ark is there, and if you actually look up a picture of Dagon, they have a few different... Uh, um, a couple artist representations of it. So um, one of them is uh, Dagon. It's actually like um, a fish, looks like the tail end of a fish, and then he kind of uh, swoops up and his body's kind of straight up out of the fish. And then there's like a person out of the fish. So he's half fish, half man. Sort of like what we would consider like a mermaid if you were to look at that. But... Um, the other op, um, uh, way that he was um, portrayed, which I personally think was most likely the, the way that he was portrayed in, um, in this temple, was a picture of him somewhat standing up. And his body was all like, um, like fish, except the tail went you know, backwards af- after the legs were shown. So these legs kind of just popped out of this fish body, and then it curved back, and then there was a little bit of a tail. So it could, the, the idol could stand up. And um, he had like two hands kind of holding out, and uh, obviously his head, there was a, a part that looked like a fish head, part head of a human part of a fish. And this is what they would worship. And so... I can imagine this, this God of theirs that they worship, I, I kind of envision it, him standing there and you know, showing his two hands. And um, they're so proud of their, of their catch of the day. They decide to put that right in front of Dagon. And this is, this is something. This is, obviously, we, it, God didn't want us to erect a statue of him. He didn't, he didn't ask, like, okay, now, to worship me, I want you to bow down to this image. God's completely against that. There are some churches that follow that, and they're not following what God said. God never once asked to, you know, here's Jesus. I want you to put a picture of him and, and uh, instruct him just this one specific way. No, that's idols, idol worship. God just used this ark 
And this was essentially like God's house, if you will. So when they brought this ark, there was very specific, and you'll, you'll find out later on if you read uh, later into chapter 5, they were very specific on what they could and couldn't do, who could um, touch the ark, who could, you know, all these kinds of things. Well, obviously not touch the ark, but you know, who could carry the ark um, from one location to another. And some people even opened the ark to look inside. And they were killed for even doing that. God's very specific about his place, his, his dwelling. And this ark was, was a special thing for Israel. So if you could take the most special thing that Israel has and take it, oh, what are you going to do with it? You're going to showcase that to everybody. Look what we got. I would almost compare it to what the Americans did when they took over Europe. And they went into one of those, I can't remember which castle it was, that Goering was actually held. And they got Goering's car. Oh, wow. I can't believe this. And if this, this vehicle went all around and everybody would pay money to see this vehicle. Look what we got. I mean, this was Goering's pride and joy. His car. And he loved this color. He loved this car. And it's in near mint condition. Look at, look at, come and see Goring's car. You know, people would pay money just to come and see that car. You know, if you drive just a little bit south today um, in, uh, I think it's Prim, you'll see Bonnie and Clyde's vehicle. And you can go through, and it's kind of eerie. I mean, it is the death car the car that Bonnie and Clyde died in. And if you literally, I, I told my mom this and she's, she was grossed out. She's like, I would never want to see that. That's just disgusting. But like literally, if you position your head just right, you can see where some of the bullets went straight through that vehicle, through the passenger door, right through the driver door, through this door, through that door. You can see this, this item it's relic. It's a way to showcase like, hey, look what we've done. And I can imagine when people went to the house of Dagon, look at what we did. You know, they, those Israelis thought, thought their God was so powerful. Look at us. And I can imagine, we, I mean, we talk about it and, and jokingly, you know, let me, let me go ahead and toot my own horn. But no, that's what they're doing. Look at how amazing we are. Everybody, let's give us a hand. Hey, you know, I, I would pat myself on the back, but can't reach very well. So, Pastor, go ahead and pat me for me, okay, would you? I mean, look at how good we are. I mean, look at this. This is so awesome. And I can imagine people were filing in to see the ark that Dagon got. Oh, this God is not powerful. Just look at what Dagon did to this God. And then, oh man, I can imagine it was a red letter day for Dagon. Well, the next morning starts. Every day's new. Guy gets up in the morning. Uh, I can imagine he's like, well, I got to go to, you know, go prepare the altar for, of Dagon. Gets his coffee for the morning, you know, fries his eggs and, and bacon. And, you know, he's out the door and, and then he probably sees something a little odd. You see, Dagon is, is that, that, uh, that fish god that I really personally believe was standing upright. That specifically because of the scripture verse. And Dagon is not a small god. He's not little. It's just a big altar. This isn't a little tiny god that's just, you know, carved, hand-carved one day. This is most likely a very, very big statue. And the Bible says um, in verse 3, and when, um, and when they of Dagon, or, or Ashdod, arose early in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Dagon this false God, the Bible says that people, they worship gods that, that have ears, but they hear not, eyes, but they see not. 
And this God that's not even a, a living thing, it's made an, out of an inanimate object. I don't even know if they made it out of stone or if they made it out of wood or what. But this little G God had to even bow before the ark of God. This inanimate object had to even pay reverence to God. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. I can imagine they like, this has never happened before. Dagon fell over. Did you feel the earthquake last night? It must have been an earthquake. I didn't feel an earthquake. I didn't either. Oh, wow. That is so amazing. I wonder what happened. It must have been some of those, you know, kids. Instead of knocking over mailboxes, they decide to knock over Dagon. And Dagon will have his vengeance on those, those evil people. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, the next day, behold, Dagon was fall fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump was left of him. This is why I personally believe that uh, Dagon wasn't, uh, um, in, in, in this statue, it wasn't the one of, of his long tail, because it would, it would have been a lot easier for the statue to fall back over. So, It would have been something coming in. This, this happened the first night. That's weird. That's odd. But two nights in a row? Oh, that's something. Dagon is back down on the ground again. Both arms are gone. And that head is rolled away a little bit. And I can imagine, what are we going to do? This is definitely God. I imagine this freaked them out a little bit. Rightfully so. The Bible says, Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashtod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashtod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emrods, even Ashtod and the coast thereof. And so this isn't enough. Now, <laughs> These people are in pain. These people are not having the best day. They said, the God of Israel shall not abode with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon, our God. In verse 8, they sent, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, what should we do to the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, let the ark of God be carried um, unto Gath. And they carried the ark of God of Israel hither. And it was so that after they'd carried it about the, the, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. And they had emeralds in their secret parts. Therefore, the, they sent the order of God to Ekron, and it came to pass that the ark came into Ekron. The Ekronites cried and said, they have brought the ark of God to, of, of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So I would literally compare this. This is a, this ark is causing more mayhem than these people really bargained for. So they, they first off, they, they decide to put it in their temple. And, you know, Dagon now doesn't have any arms. It doesn't have a head. It just has a stump. So this is, we're not going to be able to, we've got to, now we've got to go ahead and we've got to make a new altar. Good job. This is awesome. And so, you know what they decide? Well, let's go ahead and move it over here. And uh, hey, guys, guess what? We've got a really good treat for you. We're going to give you the Ark of the Israelites Oh, what? Are you serious? Oh, yeah. That's how much we like you, Gath. We're going to give you the ark. And they're all excited, I can imagine. Oh, sweet! And then they start getting emeralds. And so, what are we going to do with this ark? Well, I got a good idea. How about we go ahead and give it to these people? And so they, they pass off. And I mean, these people are passing around the ark of God, and they are... <sighs> they're having a real hard time sitting down. You know, they, they're having a... This is not a good situation. 
They're beside themselves. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? There's so many good ways you can go with this story, but I, I'll, I'll let them slide for now. They decide, let's go ahead and get rid of this God that has come inflicted terror on our land. And they put st- certain things in there and, and basically like kind of send it back. You know, when um, way back when, you know, this is many, 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 many years ago. I remember writing down return to sender. You guys ever do that? Oh, yeah. Now that now they don't even like, why are you doing that? We don't want, if you don't want the mail, throw it away. I mean, it's like, you know, really? I thought you're supposed to return this to, you know, it's, you get the weirdest looks from people when you actually do what you're supposed to do, you know? Um, And I can imagine right now, they're thinking, why did we ever accept this mail? Return to sender, you know? And uh, this is, get rid of this now, please. These Philistines find out Just how powerful their God is. Their God can cannot even handle to be in the presence of the Lord. I wonder if Christians today treated God with as much reverence as the world treats him. Oh, not, not like in Seattle and all these other places where they decide, let's go ahead and burn the word of God. I'm not referring that. I'm referring, how would, P, how would we start acting as if we feared God so much like the world fears him? You know, where if you were even mentioning the name of God, oh, don't mention that, don't mention that name, I don't want to hear that. What if we actually had the same fervor for God that the world has of fear of God? The Philistines are just so quick to get rid of God. And you know what's sad? We as Christians are similar to the people of Israel when they got the the Ark of God. Some of them didn't even want it because they heard of what happened to the Philistines and they're pushing the Ark of God away. Oh no, I don't want it anymore. Get rid of it. You take it. No, you take it. I wonder if we as Christians today would would actually take would actually take God would actually take the ark. You know, so many people wanted it at the very beginning because why they only looked at it on their selfish reasons. We want this thing to help eradicate the Philistine army. But they didn't make sure their heart was right first. When you look at the Bible, you look at all of these different people that were looking to use God and to only just get all they could get out of God. It's almost like today we come to church and we think, well, you know, if I do this to God, God is going to treat me like I'm this amazing person. You know, there's people that are on TV now that have beautiful hair even more beautiful than mine. I know, it's amazing, right? I mean, so there are people that have a little bit more hair than me. I'm, I'm so jealous of them. But uh, they have these beautiful haircuts and these $1,000 suits. And when they talk, they never raise their voice and they sound so pleasant and wonderful. And they tell you that God is going to do something amazing. If you only send me $1,000 each person, I know God is going to bless your life. Find me the chapter and verse. Find find me the spot that says that if you just buy me one more plane, God's going to do something amazing for you. If you buy my book, God is going to lift you out of this terrible debt. I, I kind of wonder which God they were referencing to. Are they referencing the God of Dagon? Because they're not referencing the God of the Bible. I wonder if we as Christians actually took God serious. 
I mean, this isn't a, a this isn't a make you feel good and just you're know, dancing out of the church. I had such a fun time. No, this this is this is a piercing arrow to me as well. What if we treated God the way He ought to be treated? Not look at God as just this this uh, you know little genie that you rub the bottle and he pops up. Okay, you got three wishes. But that's what we treat God. Well, you know, God, here's here's what I want. You know, God, I I want this new car and the boat, and I and uh, I and I want to go out fishing every other week. And uh, and God, if you do that for me, then I'll follow you. But people do that today. I think it's so sad that we as Christians, quote unquote treat God just like these Israelis treated him. If you look at the Bible, the, the, um, the young man that decided, I, I know Jericho, when that, when that city drops, we're going to go in, we're going to take everything out of that city, all the gold, all the silver, all the precious things, things out of that city and we're going to give it to God it's God's but I really like that Rolex I mean do you see those Yeezys that that guy's got on right there those are nice shoes man did you check out that pant and suit combo inside his um, inside his closet that was like thousand dollar suits. They won't miss just one. You know, I'm just going to take this. I'm just going to take this. And I'm going to take this. God doesn't need it. What happened is, this, is the Israeli people were defeated by a far inferior force. Because of one man's decision. I kind of wonder... If Hophni and Phineas are the reason for this battle, that it is a decimation. I mean, they just went through and annihilated the Israeli army. I wonder, are they at fault? Yeah, I don't know. It could be. If you look at what Hophni and Phinehas were doing, they were wicked, very, very wicked men. And they were priests. They were men of God, someone that you would look to, but they were dirty men. You know, I kind of wonder today if God looks at us and says, I want to do a work at Gateway. But look at that person. Now, before you think I'm signaling you out and I'm pointing fingers at you, trust me, I'm pointing fingers at myself. You know, I wonder if God's saying, you know what, I would love to do a work at Gateway, but look at Brother Jason. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do this. He, he thinks he's following me. Look at what he's doing. I wonder if God... I wonder if God is saying that today. This is not a really good, warm and fuzzy message. But it's a really telling one. We, we always say God with us. We have it on our, you know, on, our, um, on our currency. In God we trust. But what God is that? Is that the God of the Old Testament? Or is that the God of Dagon? Do we say, God, I trust you with my life, but in return, we're like, you know what, God, I know you said to give, you know, I know you talked to my heart and told me, I want you to give this a little amount, you know, in the offering plate, and in addition to tithe, I know you said that in my heart, but here's what I want to do. I want to invest this money because I, I mean, Nothing personal, God. I just don't trust you. 
You know, I wonder what this world would be like if we had Christians that were wholeheartedly given to God. I can't tell you how many times, and I, and I say this to my regret, how many times I felt God, I mean, I felt God say, I want you to give that person a new life. Give that person a track. I want you to tell them about me. But then I say, no, 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 no. No, God, you don't understand. I'm on my way out this door. I am heading to my next job as I turn the key, and I don't have time for this. I wish I could say, Brother Jason does the thing of stop, put that car in, brake, and turn the car off, go get that invite, and walk. You know what? I just felt God wanted me to give this to you. I have done that a whole bunch of times. And, but there's once in a while, there's a time where I go, no, God, no, 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 no. God, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Maybe that person that, we, that God was impressing on me is the one person that God wanted to see get saved. That person was ready, but I said, you know, today, I'm not going to follow what God wants. I will follow what Dagon wants. The thing I challenge you with is just follow God. You know, God loves you so much that he looked down at when he was on the cross. Not only did he, was he willing to get on the cross, but before he got on the cross, he looked at me, sinful brother Jason, and said, you know what? Even brother Jason, as guilty and as disgusting as his sin is, I will get on that cross. And even though brother Jason will, almost like Peter, will just like, deny me you know i i have a perfect will for his life but he will just be like no what god i'm not going to follow what you want even though i'm still willing to get on his on that cross for brother jason last part and just a challenge are we going to serve the god of israel are we going to serve the god of the bible or are we going to serve that little g god of Dagon. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much. Lord, a very hard message to preach. Lord, I challenge you, Lord, these people to serve you. Lord, I know it's not easy. I know it's hard to trust you with our life, but Lord, you demand it. You say, you tell us to, to believe in you, to, to trust you, Lord, with our lives. And God, I pray that, Lord, if your people are holding back a portion of their life to you, God, and not trusting you with their life, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they'll give that up. They'll give up that idol. And, Lord, they'll give their, their lives to you because you are worthy. Thank you, God, so much. For it's your name we ask. Amen. Pastor.